Our next speaker is a professor of wireless communication at the KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. He is an IEEE Fellow, Digital Futures Fellow, and Wallenberg Academy Fellow. He has a podcast and YouTube channel called Wireless Future. Now, he's received the 2018 IEEE Marconi Prize Paper Award in Wireless Communications, the 2019 Eurosip Early Career Award, the 2019 IEEE Communications Society Fred W. Ellisick Prize, the 2019 IEEE Signal Processing Magazine Best Column Award, the 2020 Pierre Simon Laplace Early Career Technical Achievement Award, the 2020 CTTC Early Achievement Award, and the 2021 IEEE Comsoc RCC Early Achievement Award. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Emil Bjornsson. Hello, nice to meet you all. So I hope you, you can hear and see me and uh, that uh, you can soon see my slides. Is that... Uh, uh, yes, perfect. So I'm very happy to be here today to talk about one of the research areas that uh, I have been most excited about in the past few years. Uh, I mean, as researchers, you always work with a number of different things, but some are close to your heart. And, and this is, is one of these areas. So multimode MIMO communication beyond beam firming is the name. And I will talk uh, to a large extent about uh, what lies beyond beam forming, and then towards the end, I will come into uh, what this means in terms of what I call multi-mode MIMO. So just to, to recap uh, some of the, these basic kind of things here. So this whole talk will be about uh, uh, using antenna rays to do something to do in communications. And the classical way of using antenna rays are for two different purposes. One is to do what we call adaptive beam forming, where you can form signal beams uh, focused in different directions. So the antenna array that you are using, putting a, on your rooftop here, in a, for example, 5G mast, it doesn't have a one directivity, but it can change directivity by sort of sending the same signal from multiple antennas, but with different phase shift. So you get the red beam, the green beam, or the blue beam here bouncing off a building. And we uh, then had the second option, which we call spatial multiplexing and uh, particularly the gains that that can perform. So while beamforming is sort of focusing signal energy so that you get a larger fraction of the rate of the power at the location where you want it to be, spatial multiplexing is all about using these three beams, for example, at the same time. So to this device and to this device, we can communicate at the same time, at the same frequency, and if you do it well, they will barely interfere with each other. And this user device here, which is getting two beams, if it has two antennas, uh, it can resolve those two beams. And uh, it can double its data rate or capacity. And here you will have three times the capacity than in, in the best cases, uh, compared to if you want to transmit one beam at a time. And this is what we call my more multiple input, multiple output. So the multiple inputs here would be the antenna array, so they have multiple antennas. And the mobile output would be this use the devices and the antennas within each one of them. And this is, of course, a known concept for a long time. What became particularly successful in 5G is what we call massive MIMO. And that was mainly about uh, sending different signals at the same time, at the same frequency, to many users. So this is what I'm illustrating here, like one beam per user. M maybe... Uh, we will send two beams per user, but, but that's it. So it's mainly about multiplexing of users. And what I will focus on today is that how we in the future could also use its features much more to send multiple data streams to the same user. So if you have a look at what is it that we have in 5G today, it, it is this kind of antenna rays that you see me holding here at the, the right-hand side. Uh, this is a 3 gigahertz band antenna array. Um, containing 32 and 64 antennas. So there are some different options there behind me. Uh, these are from Ericsson's headquarters in Stockholm, where I'm working uh, in the neighboring building at KTH. And as you see, it's less than a meter tall and half a meter wide, and this weighs like uh, 12 kilos or something. So it's not something heavy, so when, and it's not something big. So when we say massive, it's only about massive in numbers of antennas. <laughs> 
And of course, if you take something like this and put it at the uh, top of the building, as you see here, then even if it's massive in number of antennas, it will look small from the vantage point of the user here down on the ground, which is why forming beams in the conventional way is what we will continue doing in 5G. But what I will focus on in this talk is what might happen if we make the antenna arrays much larger. For example, if we were spread out antennas over the entire building side here. In this case, the array will be large. If we have a large aperture, it will fill up a large portion of your field of view. So as the user, it might then yeah, fill up a large uh, angular area. And then we will be operating in something that has to do with the near field. And I think the previous speaker also mentioning the relative near field. This is essentially the same kind of things here happening. And what this could potentially turn into is that instead of sending a signal beam, we will focus energy around the user. And more precisely, we might be able to set, focus multiple signals around the same device. Even if there's no object around that can help us bringing in the signal from a different angle, we might still be able to do a massive multiplexing of signals to the same device, just because we can focus the signal energy very narrowly. So the core of this talk will be to explain to you how this is possible and when it is possible. And as a starting point for that, I then need to begin with saying what is near field. And we start with a passive antenna in conventional law. So if you look at electromagnetic textbooks, what the near field and far field is about is what happens when you have a transmitter, which might be physically large. So it has a larger side here, which is called capital D. And then we have a measurement point where we like to figure out how the wave transmitted from this transmitter would look like. And there is a distance, lowercase d, to the uh, measurement point. But if you compare the distance from each of the edges of this uh, uh, big transmitter, well, then there is an additional distance delta, so d plus delta, the wave needs to tra uh, travel. And depending on how large this distance d is, there are potential things that might vary. So the uh, amplitude might be different from the edge to the center uh, when measured at this measurement point because the shared distance is different. So the wave has been thinned out uh, in different ways depending on how far it has to move. And we also might have the effect that since the distance is different, they might be a phase shift. So the signal that is traveling from the edge will have traveled a longer distance, turning into a phase shift when it reaches the measurement point. And usually it is the phase shifts that we care about. So you might have heard of a number of different distances uh, so, uh, that have particular names. So we have a transmitter here. We have something we call the Fresnel distance. And Here's a formula for this one that depends on the size of the transmitter, the wavelength lambda. And if you are closer than this distance, well, that is when you can see this kind of a particular so-called, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Not radiative, but um, uh, anyway, we have, uh, we, we have the coupling effects, for example. So when you do mobile payments, for example, then you, you see this additional parts of the field that are not radiated, but only sort of measured around the transmitter. And this is not what I'm after in this talk. I'm after uh, what we call the radiative near field here, uh, which is also known as the Fresnel region, which goes from this Fresnel distance up to what we call the Fraunhofer distance. And this Fraunhofer distance is usually said to be 2 times capital D squared divided by lambda. And this formula, you find it in all textbooks in electromagnetics, it's seldom really define why would be exactly that distance uh, that or strongly motivate at least. You can find motivation like this, saying that, well, for some reason, we would like the waves that come from the center and from the edge, uh, with the blue and the red one here, to be reaching the measurement point with a phase difference that is less than the pi of 8 at the carry wavelength. Then you can do some math. You can say, well, um, we can compute the distance difference between the uh, longest pathway from the edge and from the center. Uh, it has a particular formula, the extra path difference between them. You can apply a, uh, uh, a Taylor approximation here. 
find a formula, you say, well, if the uh, this approximate extra distance here is smaller than pi over 8 when we talk about wavelength, then you get this column for distance. I, I'm not uh, expecting you to follow every step in this derivation. My main point is that someone said, well, if the phase difference is uh, pi over 8 or smaller, well, then uh, we should be able to neglect the phase difference. And it, that turns into this problem for distance. But it, it's really arbitrarily selected. And it's not necessary that this is important also in communications when we are interested in data rates and how much data we can transfer the channels. So if we turn this around and look a bit more from a communication perspective, here's another way of viewing it. We let the transmitter the, or the measurement point from the previous slide be the one transmitting a wave. And we, we ha instead have a large receiver. So now the receiver have a size, capital D, the transmitter is a point source. And the red here is going to show you the wave front of the signal. And now you can see that when the wave front is hitting the center of my receive antenna, there is an additional distance that I need to move. So, and once again, then, if the distance to the center is D, then the extra distance that I need to travel to have a pi rate phase difference, it's the same kind of thing here. The extra distance here would turn into a phase shift smaller than pi r8 if the distance to the antenna is greater than d, capital F, the uh, Fraunhofer distance. Once again, 2, capital D squared divided by lambda. So this Fraunhofer distance is also appearing in these situations. And this had then to do with whether you can see phase differences over an antenna or not. And this is what is going to be important later on. So even if the big wave that you're radiating is always going to bend it, always going to be spherical, well, if you have a large enough receiver, you can still see uh, that kind of curvature. If it's small enough, well, it will look locally plain when you receive it. I was also mentioning amplitude differences. So it might be that the distance to the center and to the edge is sufficiently large in, in difference, so that the wave hitting the edges here have been thinned out more. And one can compute to, uh, that already when the distance here is uh, like 1.2 times the size of the, uh, the receiver, you essentially get 92% of the amplitude at the edge compared to the center. So we, when you are beyond that, you practically don't see any amplitude difference. M my point is the following. Consider a typical uh, 5G scenario. 3 gigahertz band, you have an, uh, an antenna which uh, is maybe smaller or equal to the wavelength, so say that's equal to the wavelength on the diagonal, that's 1.5 meters, then the amplitude differences can be uh, observed up to 1 point, uh, 0 0.1 meter, 0 0.2. And this crown of resistance, if you put in the size and the wavelength, it turns into that it's two wavelength where you can observe it, and that is 0 0.2 meters. So, all the things I've been talking about, seeing amplitude differences over the receiver, seeing uh, uh, some kind of phase difference over the receiver, that doesn't really happen in any 5D use case, because you will always be many meters away from the receiver. So the whole Fresnel reading kind of thing is really irrelevant. But this can change if we start to have physically large arrays. So here is an example of what could happen. So you have once again a transmitter transmitting. I have receive antennas, each of them having a size capital D, but now I have multiple of them. So there's one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, and so on. So each antenna is small, but the total aperture W here is large. So the antenna array as such is large. And I will now mention something that I call the Fraunhofer's array distance. So this is when uh, we are operating in the following case where we are in the far field of each individual antenna. So the distance to each individual antenna is much larger than this Fraunhofer distance I talked about before. But if you take the same formula and you put in W, the uh, uh, size of the entire array, well, then we are at a distance that is smaller than this Fraunhofer array distance. And what does this mean? Well, it means that every single element will see a wave that looks like it's have constant amplitude, constant phase over the surface, it's uh, like a plane wave coming in. 
But if we compare the phases or the amplitudes, in particular the phases, between the elements in the array, you will observe the curvature. And this is what helps us to extract additional information from signals. And if I now give you the same kind of example, 3 gigahertz band, 0 0.1 meter is the wavelength. And I say that I will have an array which is 10 wavelengths for 1 meter long on the longest side, say, the diagonal. Then the Fraunhofer array distance, 2 times w squared divided by lambda, becomes 20 meters. And if I make my array 10 meters long, then it turns into 2 kilometers. So all of a sudden, if you make the arrays already in conventional frequency bands, like 3 gigahertz, 10 meters by 10 meters, or, or, or something like that, then you will have a Fraunhofer array distance, which is kilometers. So essentially, everything you're trying to serve will be within that range, which is opening up to communicate in the radiative near field. So what does this mean? Well, it means that certain things that we have neglected in the past when it comes to modeling both the channels and what we can do in our communication protocols will change. And we need to have channel models and an understanding of that changes in order to understand what we can do. And we will see that this leads into multi-mode, minor communications after a while. So if I now have a transmitter user here, and I have an array here with many elements, these are the black elements, and I have a length cap L here uh, on the horizontal and the vertical side here. Well, if we are, are computing the conventional far field path loss in line of sight, what we would do is that we will take the total area on my uh, array, L square, and then I will take the area of a sphere with the radius set, which is a distance set here to the center. Uh, so 4 pi set square, that is the surface area of a sphere with that side. So the signal is spreading out, uh, it lives on the surface area of a sphere. We compare that area at the distance with the size of the antenna array, and that would sort of represent what fraction of transmitted power we are receiving. So in the far field, we can do this because the wave that is hitting the receiver is locally going to be plain, but it's not the case in the near field. In the near field, there are different things we need to care about. We have different distances to different antenna elements here, and these will turn into different amplitudes. We are seeing the antenna elements from different angles. That also means that even if the physical size of the antenna is the same, the effective area is different because it looks smaller when you look at it from an angle. And there's also things uh, to have to do with the polarization of waves. The polarization of the wave might be perfectly tuned when it reaches the center of the ray, but then it will be skewed when it comes to the edges. And this also needs to be taken into account when you're really close to an antenna ray. And in the paper here that you see on the bottom, power scaling laws are a near field behavior of massive vibrant intelligent reflecting surfaces. We obtain this uh, kind of formula, which is telling us more precisely what will be the uh, path loss in free space in the radiative near field. And I'm not going to go into exact details, but it's, it's the same kind of thing here. The uh, user that transmits is uh, here in the center of the array at the distance set. We have L by L is the size of it. And within this formula, things that are appearing is beta set. This is the far field path loss. But there are also some other things showing up here. There's pi, there's a tangent inverse, and there are some complicated things here. We will use it for simulation next slide. But some interesting things that might happen here is that if we let the distance set be large, what is going to happen is that certain terms here will dominate. So uh, in these cases, the path loss is small. So whenever you compare the path loss to one uh, like this, well, then these terms goes away. So here we get beta set over three. The tangents because almost becomes almost linear. So we can take it away and we can take away this part here. We get two over three times beta set. So in the far field, uh, when distance is large, this formula turns into the conventional formula. So we can use this formula both in the radiative near field and in the far field, but in the far field, it doesn't provide any additional insights. If we instead lot let the array becomes very large, we can actually use this formula and let the size, the L, goes to infinity. And if the universe is infinite, well, then that's actually possible to essentially build. And 
one can then show that this formula converges to one over three. And it's good it converges to something because it, we can't receive more power than we transmitted. So we need to, at maximum, get a one as the power flows with an infinitely large array. Why don't we get one? Well, first of all, half of the power goes backwards. We can only capture half of it. That would be one over two. But why did we get one over three? Well, we actually lose some in polarization losses when the signal comes in from, from very weird angles uh, when you are, they are far away. Okay, so we can use this formula. The question is, do we need to use this more complicated formula or not? And when are these phenomena actually appearing? So once again, we had these three different uh, phenomena that I was mentioning, different distances, different effective areas, different polarization losses. And here I'm showing you a simulation where uh, I have a fixed distance, 20 meters to an array which is square sized. Uh, and then I was looking at the diagonal of this array and I make it larger and larger. So I start here at this uh, small array and then becomes larger and larger. And there are four different formulas uh, or four different curves. So the upper curve is what happens if I use the far field approximation formula, uh, the, the beta that I started to talk about. Then if I am considering uh, that I have different distances to antennas, actually when you have a large array, we get a smaller number. And if I take two first properties into account, I get an even smaller number. And if I take all of them into account, I get the red curve, which is the, the accurate one. And you can see that if you have really large arrays, you need to take all of these properties into account. Otherwise, you are overestimating how good the, um, the array is going to be in terms of capturing energy. But at short distances, it doesn't really matter. And when do we actually start to care about these things? Well, that is when the diagonal is roughly half of the, the distance to the array. And this is something that we have started to call the Bjornsson distance. So it's when the distance to the array is uh, uh, equal to two times the large dimension. That is when, when things are starting to, to change, but we need to take these things into account. So what does this really mean? Well, it means that when you are in the radiative near field, things will change. You really need to consider your performance differently and also how you're operating your system differently. Here's another way of looking at that. You have an isotropic transmitter, you have an antenna right here, containing multiple elements. And what we will have is a length here, which is, uh, I have the, the diagonal of each element is D. So this side here is square root of N, the number of elements that they have, times D over square root of two. So this is the length by the length. And the first thing to care about is whether we can beamform signal energy so uh, as well as we can do in the far field so that we can get the same array gain, the same amplification as we will have in the far field. And we will see a ratio between the actual channel gain that I can get divided with the channel gain that I, I could ideally get in the far field. And there are two different distances that I mentioned so far. One is the Fraunhofer array distance. And if you do the math in this case, it turns into uh, this formula, 2 n d squared over lambda squared. This is because the diagonal here is square root of n times d. And this is actually n times the Fraunhofer distance of the individual elements. And then I was talking about the Bjornsson distance, which is two times the largest the diagonal here. So two times d times square root of n. And what I'm showing you here in this formula, in this graph, I mean, is this ratio between the actual channel gain and the far field gain. Uh, on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, different distances. One can offer distance of the individual element, 10, 100, 1000, and 10,000. So these are then in logarithmic scale showing what kind of uh, result we're getting. And I'm considering a 100 by 100 antenna array with a diagonal which is equal to the weight. And you can see that when you are very close, you are having a much smaller antenna uh, uh, array gain than you would have in the far field. Simply because you are essentially very close to one of the antenna elements and the other ones are not contributing. Then when you are increasing a in distance, eventually you are reaching the Bjornsson distance. At, at that point, you are actually getting like 90% of your uh, array gain that you get in the far field. And beyond that, uh, well, you get essentially the same thing as in the far field, 
here is the front of array distance. And what I would say is that the front of array distance doesn't really say much at all about what gain we're going to get. That is what the BRG distance is telling you about. So if you are beyond that distance, you can get all of the, the gain from the antenna. But there are other interesting things happening that has to do with the front of array distance. So if you are beyond that distance, you can transmit your signals and receive your signals as if you are in the far field. So you can count on that the waves will be flat. And you can use things like array response vectors or the code books that you have in 5G, which is presuming that you will be in the far field. So uh, what will we do if we are at shorter distances? Well, what I showed in the previous slide was that we can, uh, between the Bjornsson distance and the front of ray distance, we can get the same gain as in the far field, but we need to pay attention to how we achieve it. We need to use the spherical curvature to do the beamformer properly. And with code books in 5G, you won't do that. But if you are using uh, yeah, uplink pilots and estimate the signals, for example, all the faces, then you will do this automatically. And here is where the interesting thing starts to happen. So if you have a transmitter sending a signal, you're focusing it at the point where the user is. Usually, we say that uh, at this distance, there will be a beam width. So the signal spreads out, but it has a particular uh, focus point and a particular beam width that you can have perpendicular to the direction where the signal is propagating. And the beam width, you can get different formulas. If you talk about angles, then here is the formula, uh, which is inverse in proportion to the front of ray distance. So uh, yeah, you can find that formula here. The interesting thing uh, here is that we usually talk about the free to be beam width. That is where the angular window where you can be and still see the same amplification as you would get at the focus point down by half or free to be. The new thing that happens in the radiative near field is that we also have a limited depth of focus. So usually when you focus a signal at a point, the signal continues behind you. But that doesn't need to happen in the rate of near field. And in this paper, a prime of near field beam forming for arrays of reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, we are computing this formula here, which tells us that when you're focusing the signal at the point distance f, to use the device there, then uh, you will have a depth of focus in free to be terms that uh, you had. A, the ideal strongest focusing at the focus point, and then it starts to be focused at the distance d, uh, which is computed like this. You take the front of ray distance, take the focus distance, you divide with uh, the front of ray distance plus 10 times the focus distance. And then it ends behind you at the distance which looks the same. The formula is the same, it's just a minus sign between these things. And of course, if the front of array distance is equal to 10 times the focus distance, then you get divide by zero here, and that is when this should be replaced with infinity. So at distances that are shorter than the front of array distance divided by 10, when the focus distance is like that, well, then the beam will end behind you and doesn't continue towards infinity. So here's another illustration of that. Far field versus near field beam forming. So if you're focusing at the device far away, at a distance that is longer than the front of array distance divided by 10, well then, the beam actually starts at the front of array distance divided by 10, and then it continues forever behind you. While, if you're focusing the signal at where you are, in the radiative near field, at close by distances, well then it starts, uh, not by the array, but before it reaches you, and ends after and it doesn't continue towards infinity. And this front of array distance will depend on the wavelength and the size of the array. So if you keep the array size fixed and you are decreasing the, the wavelength, well, then the front of array distance will become further and further away. And then you will be more and more in this field. And if you keep the number of elements fixed and you are changing the wavelength, well, then instead the distance shrinks. Uh, but usually we, we try to keep the aperture, the sizes fixed when we are changing wavelengths. So this will mean that as we go up in frequency, we'll be more and more in this radiative field. Here's another illustration of this. Uh, 
So we are considering different distances here. We have a transmitter red here, and we are sending a signal uh, towards the far field. And I have logarithmic scales here on the distance. So 10 Fraunhofer distances, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. So that is why it looks like the um, uh, beam here. So the focusing is where we have a yellow. This is where you have a strong amplification. Uh, so this is essentially the, uh, the fraction of the far field focusing that we are getting. So you can see that far away and in the center where I'm focusing, I get a strong focusing and elsewhere I don't get it. And usually you see that you have a sort of beam with which is fixed uh, in angle. And we actually have it here. It just looks like it spreads out because of the logarithmic scale. If I am, however, focusing at the point which is nearby, uh, in this case, um, uh, we are uh, focusing here. If I, I need to actually zoom in to see any application at all. If I zoom in, I get the small region where I have a strong focusing and elsewhere I don't have any focusing at all. So it really shows us how we can focus energy from a large array uh, in very tiny regions. So how tiny can those uh, uh, regions be? For example, in terms of beam width. Well, before I was showing you in angles, we have a particular beam width, uh, and there is a classical formula for that one. Uh, it's approximately this 1.77, and we have the square root of the wavelength, and we divide with the square root of the final rate distance. But we don't usually care about uh, the uh, angle here, but the actual physical distance. Is it large enough to capture an entire antenna or an entire tube's device? So what I will now compute is how large, how wide will uh, the beam width be when you are at the brink between the near field and the far field, at the Fraunhofer array distance divided by 10. So then I take the, the angle here and I multiply with that width and I get this formula. And what you can see here is that it is not going down with the Fraunhofer array distance, it's going up. So uh, the more you are pushing, the far field further and further away, the wider the beam will be where the far field starts, even if it's narrower in the near field. So here's the full, uh, an example of this. I have uh, a antenna right here, which is uh, some wavelengths long here. And these are my 10 antennas. And I'm focusing at the front of ray distance divided by 10. And the coloring here is telling me that I have a focus point here. There I get the full array gain. And you can see the array can get another points down to 3 dB or 0 0.5. And you have a particular beam width here uh, at different distances, but uh, around the focal point is a distance. If I make my array longer, so now it's between 5 and uh, minus 5 wavelengths here, so it's 10 wavelengths long, my uh, distance to the front of radius divided by 10 moves to the right here. So now it's at a larger distance. And if I keep the same width here as here, you see that actually the free to be beam width becomes longer. So uh, we actually are not shrinking the size of the focus area when we are making the uh, array bigger. It's just that it's closer and closer, you, you see the same kind of width. And why would this be interesting? Well, the question would be, if you are really close to the array, how quickly do you need to change uh, your beam forming. If you, someone is just moving around the array, will this become, or moving around the use device, will you have to re-estimate things all the time? Well, fortunately not. You can do some math. We did it in the paper. Uh, I will not bore you with this, uh, the uh, details. The main thing is that if I have M antennas, I can get the focusing gain proportional to M. And if I move a little bit, I will lose part of it. And I will lose half of it when I move sufficiently long and in the worst case, it can never be longer than a quarter of the wavelength. So you can all, never get a, uh, if you're very close to an antenna array, as I'm here, uh, and just two wavelengths away from the antenna array, well, then we still have a focusing with the beam width, which is uh, like four wavelengths, uh, a quarter of a wavelength wide here. So the focus area will never become super small. It's always at a minimum distance. Okay, so I've been talking for a while now, but I'm also supposed to talk about multi-mode multiplexing. And that is what we now are ready to talk about. So 
when we are communicating to a user array, usually we are in this situation. We have a transmitter here, you have a receiver here, you have a beam width, which is sufficiently large so that when you're focusing in a line of sight scenario, a signal towards this receiver, then the width is so large that it captures the entire antenna array. And therefore, we can only transmit one signal because all the signals will have the same amplitude, the same phases. Uh, when it comes in here, at least it, it will look like a plane away front, and we cannot resolve more than one such signal at a time. If you have dual polarization, you can actually have two, but uh, let's ignore that for the moment. If you take now this blue receiver and you move it much closer to the receiver, all of a sudden the beam width will become so small that it doesn't capture uh, or cover the entire receiver. And this will now, in this radiative near field scenario, allow us to send multiple signals that are resolved by this array. And these are the spatial modes, multiple signals that we can resolve at receiver. And let me be more concrete. Uh, I would consider two antenna arrays, 10 by 10. So in this case, I'm still considering a far from scenario, line of sight to the top, example from the previous slide. I have 10 antennas here, I have 10 antennas here. So they are half the wavelength space from each other. And the distance between them is now like 700 wavelengths. So they are in the far field. And what you can do in this scenario, free space, far field, you can compute the distances and the amplitudes between every pair of antennas. Uh, so you get the amplitude and phase shift. You can create a channel matrix. And then you can apply what we do in MIMO communications uh, the, the capacity is achieved by something called SVD precoding or uh, singular value decomposition. And if you compute that uh, singular value decomposition, you will see that almost all of the energy appears in one eigenvalue, uh, one eigenmode. And that's what we talk about modes. And the way of transmitting uh, that is corresponding to that mode is to, uh, you can see that I only have 20 wavelengths here and 750 wavelengths horizontally. So that's why it looks like this is a super wide beam, but actually it's just the focus of beam towards the receiver here. That's what the blue colors are showing. And then there is nothing to the sides. So you focus the signal energy, you cover the array with one beam, and that's why 98.4% of all the received energy will be going for this uh, mode. There are 1.6% of energy coming from another mode. How would you re, uh, reach the receiver in that way? Well, you are beamforming in directions to the sides, which are not actually reaching the receiver in a good way. That's why you get a small energy, but the side lobes of your signal still becomes resolvable at the receiver, and that's why you can get the one other 1.6% 1 of energy. There is also additional eight modes that you can observe, but all of them move very weak. So we don't need to care about them. All of the energy is essentially in mode one. So this is what we mean when we say we have a rank one channel in the park. But if you now take the receiver and we move it much closer, and I also, uh, actually in both cases, it was rotated slightly like this. Now it is seven wavelengths away from the array and each array is, is five wavelengths wide. In this case, I compute the channel matrix in the same way. Take the amplitude and the, the phase from the distances. And I compute a single value decomposition, and I figure out that uh, the strongest way of communicating will uh, result in this physical transmission. So you see I'm focusing somewhere here towards the lower end of the array. And in this way, I can resolve a signal containing 30% of the received signal energy. There is four additional modes, uh, one where I'm transmitting a signal towards the, the upper part here, then I'm transmitting towards the edges of the array, and then even further towards the edges of the array, and you can see that mode 1 contains 30%, this one 28, this one 24, this one 30%, and that adds up to, I think, 95% of all of the energy here. So I have 10 modes, but the four uh, strongest ones of them contain 95% of the energy, but the main point here is that we can actually uh, send four signals in line of sight, no objects around us, four signals at the same time. And by just letting the arrays be large, we can resolve this four signal and get four times the capacity because these different modes can resolve different signals at the same time. So 
what can we fundamentally do if we big, uh, have bigger rooms? Well, uh, there is a, a nice theorem from this paper here, uh, which says that a large antenna array can resolve pi signals for each segment it has within an area of lambda by lambda, so the wave of squared. And what does this mean? For example, you have an example I'm showing here. Uh, we have a big array, which is has a length L and a height H. Well, you take that area, L times H, you divide with lambda square, so you figure out how many segments do we have of that area, and then you multiply with pi. This is the number of spatial modes that a big array like this can resolve. And then some of them will be uh, useful by this user device. So in this type of array here, uh, 10 by 30 meters, 3 gigahertz band, as I was considering of before, this array as such can resolve like 100,000 different signals. And uh, a few of them, depending on how close you are, will be resolvable for each device, and the other ones will be to serve multiple devices. So my point here is that we are very far from the limits, and as you, uh, so the reach of the channel will be key here in order to figure out how many users we can serve in general, and for each device, how close they are will determine how many modes we can assign to every user. But we have a huge number of modes that is out there in the rate in the field that we can utilize for communications. And before I end, I would like to, to provide you with uh, some kind of analogy to computing. So in high performance computing, uh, we over time used to increase the clock frequency. Uh, so you can see here we went uh, uh, through megahertz ranges and then we reached like one gigahertz around the year 2000. And then we started to saturate. So we were not improving the computers anymore by getting a high and higher sampling rate or clock frequency. What did we do instead? Well, we started to eventually use multiple cores instead. And that is what is the main thing now. If you buy a new computer, you want to have more cores. And the clock frequency will still be a few gigahertz. Uh, so what is the point here? Well, in the past, we were chasing higher and higher clock frequencies. And nowadays we are chasing more and more cores and we do multiple thread computing. And in communications, I believe this is going to happen soon as well. So in the past, we have been chasing more and more bandwidth. So we went from 20 megahertz in 3D, uh, or in 4G uh, to 100 megahertz now in, uh, in 5G beginning and then millimeter wave will come along. And after a while, we will then have so much bandwidth that we are not needing that anymore. And the alternative will be more cores, or in our case, more modes. We transmit the same signal at the same frequency, and we get the opportunity to transmit many signals at the same time. So reaching the conclusion that when you are having physically large rates, you as a user will be in the far field on the individual elements, but you will might be in the near field of the entire array. So you are beyond the front of distance of the individual elements, but you are below the frontal for array distance divided by 10. And this is where the finite depth beam forming is showing up. And if you are beyond the Björnson distance, you can get the uh, all of the amplitude of the signal, but you will get different phases. And that is what allows you to do what I call multi-mode multiplexing, where the signals uh, are both limited in uh, beam width and in beam depth. And you can resolve multiple of them at the same time at the same device. And I believe that this might be the new way of increasing the data rate of our device in the future. Instead of chasing more and more bandwidth going up in frequency more and more, we might be able to use these multiple modes instead in order to communicate more and more data to our devices. So with that, thank you very much for staying all the way until the end of my talk. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Beyonson, for that presentation on multi-mode and MIMO communications beyond beam forming. And of course, uh, after that presentation, we'll now move on to the question and answer segment. I believe we have a couple of questions already from the audience, starting with this one. Will it be feasible to deploy large antennas over the entire building walls in terms of cost and power consumption. Uh, Prof, what do you think? So I think that uh, 
economics is always important. So, uh, but at first, I think as a researcher, we should figure out what would be fundamentally good with the technology, and then if something can improve things a lot, well, then eventually we will find economics to solve it. But uh, I had this example where you can resolve hundred thousand modes. Uh, so probably in the near future, we will only need a thousand of them or hundred of them. So then you don't need to put antennas everywhere. Uh, maybe a few antennas. Uh, uh, the important thing is that you fill up the facade of the building, uh, but not that they are half a wavelength spaced. They could be longer distances between them, for example. Uh, and I think that we should not build this very expensive industry grade antenna arrays as we have today, but more uh, think about that. Well, the, the radio ship in a mobile phone is not something that is particularly uh, expensive. So we should build on that type of technology instead. Thank you so much, uh, Prof, for addressing that question. We have another one from our audience right now. And this next question, Prof, is the technology that you describe seems to require many antennas in the user device. Is that possible in practice? That's a good point. So, I mean, looking again at an antenna in your phone, you have a certain area. So that one is given by you. And if you apply that formula to have you take the, the length times the height, you divide with the wavelength square, that tells you how many modes your device could uh, consider. And when we are moving up in frequency, you can squeeze in many more antenna elements into it. And that is what we already see with millimeter wave. So in millimeter wave uh, iPhones, for example, uh, you could have 16 antennas. So you could essentially resolve 16 signals. Uh, then the channel might not be rich enough for that. But uh, I think that in millimeter wave, we will be able to have a decent number of modes per device, uh, enough for, for our purposes. Thank you so much, Prof, for those insightful answers on uh, antennas. We have another question uh, coming in, and this one, Prof, is in order to increase capacity for multi-users, your idea is to reuse same frequency for different users at different beam directions. How do you take on this question? Yes, so, so that is sort of the... Uh, what we are seeing now already with 5G, that there were sort of two competing developments. One was to co continue using mid-band frequencies and use massive MIMO uh, with 64 antennas. The other thing was millimeter wave, uh, which is providing you with great bandwidth. Uh, and both of them, I mean, if you have uh, 10 times more antennas or 10 times more bandwidth, both of them can increase your capacity of your network by 10 times. What did the operators start with deploying? Well, they started with the massive MIMO in the conventional bands because you're reaching uh, your coverage area in a much better manner. So, uh, so that is what I'm building on here. The idea that if that was what was the most successful thing so far in 5G, and uh, then when the number of users is increasing, why not increase the number of antennas proportional to that so that we can deal with the signals once again by sending beams to different users instead of having a large amount of spectrum that we to share. Thank you so much, Prof, for expanding further into that question. Our next question is, any thought on simplification of multi-mode selection and beam forming weight computation, especially due to SVD? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so this is a, is a great uh, point. Uh, and I think this is where a lot of people are doing research in this area as well. Uh, so when it came to massive mind with 64 antennas, people said, oh, the complexity is going to be too large. Uh, that turned out to not be true, but eventually we will hit that limit. So, and I think an SVD operation here will probably be cubically in the number of, of antennas, or at least uh, antennas uh, square times users. Um, so, uh, what we need to do then is probably to to do some smart pre-processing and a lot of people try to figure out uh, what kind of modes one should consider if you have uh, you make some kind of code book of, of potential modes considering different angles different distances then you take your received signals you filter it using that bank of 
digital filters, you've tried to figure out which of these uh, uh, predefined modes that are actually being utilized for the moment, and then you use them. Uh, it, so you don't try to compute the SVD and find the optimal way of, of communicating. It's more like, okay, figure out the angles, and then around that one, I know that the mode should be uh, like that. Thank you so much, Prof, for that uh, deep thoughts on that question. We have another question that seems to be related. It's also about uh, multi-mode, and it says, can multi-mode multiplexing be realized using distributed massive MIMO? What do you think? Yes, so in a way, this is what um, distributed MIMO is also about. Uh, we haven't looked at as much about that. So, so in, in a way, when the, the antenna array becomes very large, in a way, one can also consider them to be distributed. And why put them on one building when you can put them on different buildings? And, and uh, uh, yes, these modes are out there. So if you look at it from the user device perspective, again, you can compute how many modes it uh, can uh, resolve. And then you would like to be able to transmit to it so that it fills in all of those modes and uh, probably some of them will come from the other side uh, from the front or some from the back so if you have a race on both the front and the back directions well then you will be able to to use more of those modes uh, sometimes the propagation environment around you helps you by letting the signal bounce of objects and then you can also uh, get all of those modes active but uh, yes distributed arrays is even better Thank you so much, Prof. And I got to say our audience is really participative this uh, afternoon here. And uh, we've got another question just come in and it says, an alternative way to increase the data rate per user is to use more spectrum in terahertz bands. What makes multi-mode MIMO a better solution? How do you address that? Yes, so the, the problem with uh, I mean, the reason that we go up in frequency, uh, millimeter wave uh, in 5G and then potentially terahertz bands or sub terahertz bands in 6G is just to find more bandwidth. But the problem is that the, the propagation becomes m much worse and worse. So it's only a line of sight scenarios where, where that will provide much, much gains. And you even have all of the difficulties to even sustain the link budget uh, because the, the radio hardware needs to shrink so much. Uh, uh, so there are all these complications, and we have seen already with 5G that millimeter wave haven't taken off yet. It, it will probably do it eventually. And if we then go up even more in frequency, it will be even more challenging to find use cases where it works particularly well. While this multi-mode uh, things, you can use it at conventional frequencies to some extent, at least. Uh, and you can at least use them very, very, very well in the millimeter wave band that we talk about in 5G. So I think the, the number of locations that you can cover with one antenna array will be many more and which will make it much more convenient to deploy things in this way compared to chasing more and more bandwidth instead. So, so that is what I wanted to say with that analogy to computing, that in a way you would love to have more and more bandwidth, but if the price to pay is that the coverage range becomes very bad, the power consumption becomes super high and the things becomes hot, uh, and you are only in a few cases see the actual gains, then you should look elsewhere. And I think multiple MIMO is that uh, alternative solution for the future. Thank you so much, Prof, for that comprehensive answer. And uh, there just been, seems to be just more interest in the audience in this presentation. There's another question that just came in here. It says, can these new MIMO methods also be used with intelligent reflecting surfaces can they so uh, as uh, people in the audience might have noticed some of these references that i made to some of my own works were mentioning reconfigurable intelligent or intelligent reflecting surfaces as well which is uh, 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 also about using big surfaces but not for transmitting or receiving but reflecting signals and uh, when using large surfaces in those scenarios, one should also study these kind of near field effects. Then uh, I think it's more unclear 
whether one can create many modes using those big surfaces, because the problem is that every element needs to have one configuration in such a reflecting surface. It's, it's changing the phase with one value. And if you should create many modes or control many modes, you would like to change the phase on a per mode basis. Uh, so I unfortunately doubt that one can get all of the modes out of it in a good way. But one should definitely study the near field behaviors of these big surfaces because they are supposed to be big. All right. And of course, that was our last question. Thank you so much, Professor Bjornsson for that comprehensive discussion on multi-mode MIMO communications beyond beamforming. Thank you so much, Prof.